Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry, and I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. Right, we're back with some more casual history, who does a lot of Salmonella-style history videos. And this video sounds intriguing, because it's called Scandalous Jobs of the Roman Empire. They're a pretty scandalous civilization. Can only imagine how many scandalous jobs were part of that. All right, the original video link is down below. Make sure you're supporting casual history. Give the original video a view, like, and subscribe to the channel. And be sure to sub here so we can have some more fun together. All right, let's get started. All right, ooh, what's gonna be the most scandalous of all? Jeez. The Romans were pretty gross too, so in a lot of different ways. We'll see what they got. Ancient Rome was a multi-ethnic society with a large population Pe that required a broad spectrum of jobs to sustain its economy. Child Prestigious professions, military leadership, and political administration were reserved for the Roman upper class, whereas ordinary people were involved in various jobs. Moreover, the Roman Empire depended on slaves, and any wealthy person could keep as many as 500 slaves. The All right, dang. Already got some stuff to insert there. Uh, most people, though, worked in agriculture. In fact, most people worked in agriculture all throughout human history until the Industrial Revolution. Um, and yes, Roman society was probably about a, up to about a third of it being slaves. That up to like 500 number, that's, you know, interesting because that's that's. You know, you have to be very, very rich. Most people don't own slaves, right? So uh, slave ownership is so concentrated in the aristocratic class known as the patricians that, um, yeah, it's not like everyone owns slaves, if that's what you might think of. The typical jobs were farming, construction, and domestic services, while educated slaves could work in medicine, teaching, and accounting. Some jobs, however, like the orgy planner, urine taxer, or the dwarf okay. seller were bizarre even to the slaves. I don't want to look at so that picture anymore. Ew, 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 and triple ew. Planner, okay, okay. Urine taxer or the dwarf seller were bizarre even to the slaves. So without further ado, let's begin. Um, I don't know if they'll say it, but uh, urine was something that was used to dye clothes and stuff as well. Back Number in the old one, times. the dwarf sellers. Oh, no. I already established that the people of Rome were quite fond of their slaves, so it should come as no surprise that slave trader was a relatively normal position back then. However, today I want to look at a special type of slave trader, the so-called dwarf seller. What? I don't this know. is definitely I, a weird job description. I've never heard of this. But they were a fundamental part of the Roman entertainment industry. The Roman Empire imported dwarfs from around its territory and brought them oh, to the Colosseum. There they, were, they would take part in dwarf battles. Oh my gosh. weren't to the death and functioned as light entertainment. No. You can see this as comic relief from all the real killing That's taking place during the gladiator fights. The slaves would take part in special acts such as dwarf boxing or fights between dwarfs and women. So as much as they loved blood and gore, they still needed some laughs to go with all the killing. No, no. they were forcing dwarves into slavery to fight each other. I'd never heard of that before. This is a modern version of like bum fights, except these ones, they're killing them. They put them in little gladiator like outfits and then they would die. I don't want to see that. Dude, the Romans were whack, man. Oh, the stuff they entertain. The whole idea of like watching these fights to the death and the Colosseum and stuff. It's just like, it's so wild, huh? To think about that. It's like, okay, we get <coughs> at least for the mainstream up to like UFC fighting or something like that. But like, oh my gosh, you think they were just, it was just like a desensitized culture is that how you would, you would, um, like describe that and why they're into that. Okay. Well that one, <laughs> I was not expecting that one. This is off to a pretty good start. If we want to <coughs> talk about some crazy jobs. Okay. Chicken fortune teller. Oh no. Number two, chicken fortune teller. This job actually still exists today, even though it may have changed slightly. Just like modern astrology girls who try to predict your future by your zodiac my next job? sign or tarot cards, the ancient <laughs> Romans had their own version Whoa. of that activity. The Polarius were chicken interpreters who told the fortune of military campaigns based okay. on how chickens ate. Instead of being tasked with taking care of more regal birds like eagles or owls, the Polarius had to take care of sacred military chickens. I'm not shitting you. One of the strongest empires in history literally had sacred chickens that were relied on to tell whether a battle would go well or not for the Roman army. Said how they Before eat, a battle, but... the Polarius would release the chickens and throw corn on the ground. No, they wouldn't. Romans didn't have corn. Corn was not corn is native to the Americas. Someone help me out here. There was no corn in the Roman Empire. There was other types of things like, like grains and stuff, but not not corn. Ate 
all was well. If they ate so messily, they dropped kernels. Even better, if they didn't eat, oh no, if they refused to come out of their cages, you may as well send everyone home. There even is a story about one Roman fleet commander who was so impatient with the poor birds, who were understandably dizzy from sailing, not wanting to come out of their cage, that he They're threw them overboard. Oh my gosh. He lost the battle and was scolded for drowning oh. his fleet. Number three. Oh gosh, Vestal Virgins. Okay, that's a common thing, but um, my favorite storytelling or fortune telling uh, thing, or one of them at least, was <clears throat> actually the first ever writing we have of China, the oldest surviving writing we have to come out of China. Um, we're on what are called oracle bones. So these like shamans would write questions or something, um, something they wanted feedback on onto the bones of animals. It could be like a turtle shell, but like a could be like a big pelvic bone. And then they would put it uh, uh, on heat and then that would uh, make it expand. And the way that it would crack apparently gave some kind of answer and the shamans could like uh, they could interpret that to mean something. So there's that Oracle Delphi is an interesting one too, where basically you just have these young women that get high because there's like noxious gases that come out of this part of the mountain there at uh, uh, Delphi. And then they just have these crazy visions and use them for <laughs> to, to actually like instruct policy and ward conduct. The Vestal Virgins. The Vestals were the priestesses of the Roman goddess Vesta, the goddess of the hearth, and were considered vital to the security of Rome. The duty of the Vestals was to keep the fire in the temple of Vesta burning. Okay. They believed that the failure to do so would lead to chaos in the empire. Vestals who broke any vow, such as letting the temple fire go out, oh no. were beaten behind a curtain in the dark. Aww. And this was the good ending. So let's talk about Wait, the bad what? ending. As you can already that was guess, the good it was essential for the Romans that the Vestals were virgins. You might touch the finish line, but you never touch the Oracles of Delphi. You're right. I haven't lost my virginity. This was obviously a drawback and a risk at the same time. If they were to lose their virginity, they were usually walled alive. This means nothing less than getting locked behind a brick wall until Even if you it was non-consensual, die. I could imagine more pleasant ways to go out. However, a faithful you, you can't just be fired from the job or something. Like just all right, you can't be here anymore. It's like no, you have to be walled in alive. Why do I have to be walled in? Why do I have to be alive when I do this? You just do. Virgin was the gods have spoken. fairly well and lived a secure life. I mean, even today, some monks and nuns still vow to abstain from any sexual activity. Oh, yeah. Although, luckily, the punishments today aren't nearly as harsh. Number four, God. the org. Oh, there's a whole planner. I mean, the Romans, dude. Have you guys ever actually looked at like the? I probably shouldn't keep this G frame planner. on very long. Um, looked at the writings and the artwork that they found at Pompeii. It's some X-rated stuff everywhere. In all of these homes. Now, Pompeii, I guess, was kind of like a resort town. It was like their Vegas. So you go there and, and party anyways. And Roman partying was, oh, man, X-rated. But, yeah, uh, you might want to be careful of what you say. Uh, read and what you see from the mosaics and artwork that survived. Now we get to the job all of you were waiting for. Orgy planners were responsible for planning the perfect orgies and sex parties, where guests would freely partake in open and unrestrained sexual activities. They had the authority to select the food, it was so drinks, open. and music, as well as beautiful men and women. The Greco-Roman world shared the party god Bacchus, lord of wine and ritual madness. They so the, okay. celebrated him with either. the Bacchanalia. Attendance so, yeah, Bacchus, it goes back to... Um, uh, with um, uh, uh, ancient Greece too, um, so you <laughs> god of wine, right? And people love worshiping Bacchus, right? Because it was literally um, uh, you partied, you got drunk. That's how that's how you worship the god. So it was like they love their parties. But yeah, Romans and you guys understand in ancient times like this. Um, in, in in some in certain cultures like Greco Roman culture, sexuality and things were just so it was such an open thing right homosexuality and just openness of that uh just not having that prudishness that we think of today and not all not necessarily all ancient civilizations were like that but they were like 
the extreme. <laughs> of these parties had a tendency to really tap into that divine, crazy party energy and go around on a debauched, often violent sex spree. At one orgy, Fuck, the gosh. legendary bisexual Alcibiades and his homies stole the dicks of hundreds of statues throughout Athens. By the way, the same Alcibiades guy was a lover of Socrates and famous for cuckolding the Spartan king. Um, man, it, you guys have played um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. They 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 went all in on developing that character uh, in that in that way. Is this you know you heard you just heard the explanation? They went all in on that. However, the orgy he, he is in all over. By the way, in Plato's Republic, um, he is Alcibiades all over the place in that book. Plato wrote a lot about him of Socrates and famous for cuckolding the Spartan king. However, the orgy planners were despised, especially by the lower class, as they thought the entire event to be unnecessarily luxurious and expensive, or simply because they didn't get an invite themselves. <laughs> Number five, the shit collector. Hey, somebody's got to do it. I mean, think about it. Rome had like a million people in it. Have you ever thought about human waste and just just like waste management in general? I mean, those cities were disgusting, right? And yeah, okay, they had the running aqueducts and stuff like that, but there's no way. And it's why in Rome, too, you had disease. Disease was super common in ancient Rome. Um, the plague, is, like, it came out. Like, it the was so called This is something you would have had to literally deal with is poop. Poop. Corarius, or to say it more bluntly, the shit collector. Ancient Rome was famous for its aqueducts and toilets. People would do it in public too. So advanced, it would take centuries to see them return after the fall of Rome. What a lot of people forget is that most of these advanced services were available only for important public yeah. buildings. Regular Even that residential was areas where most people lived were not on the plumbing grid. That's why the Stercorarius had to go from house to house and collect people's shit bucket by bucket and wagon by wagon. He then had to drag everybody's shit outside the city, where he would sell it to farmers. For his troubles, Manure, the Stercorarius got 11 copper coins, so he wasn't particularly rich. Considering Rome's bumpy stone streets, <laughs> it wasn't a rare occurrence for one of these shit wagons to literally flood the Stercorarius. <laughs> I love this picture. It's so gross, but it's so funny. I love it. <laughs> Tipped over. On him. So if this wasn't your fetish, oh, it's some lowbrow humor. I know I shouldn't be six, laughing, right? I shouldn't be year. laughing at it. Oh, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, urine. Yeah, urine. Uh, I said at the beginning of the video, urine was used for multiple things across different cultures. Again, some of it would be to like bleach clothes and stuff and uh, yeah, drink it in, in certain circumstances. I know like they would mess with urine during the plague. They could help to be a treatment or something. Urine but, taxer. Yeah. The urine tax collector was basically the big brother of the shit collector. But as stupid Which as one would you want to do? It actually had an important background. Urine was widely used in various chemical processes, such as extracting ammonia to clean and whiten clothes, yep. soaking animal skin before tanning, and even using it oh, as that's toothpaste. Right. I yeah, I heard about it too. Have you ever thought about the toothpaste? They use urine for toothpaste. And I guess it could do the job, but it's still so disgusting. Did they, did they not have like the reflex for that? You know, like today, if you were to do that, your body would just throw up, right? I think they didn't have the reflex for that. It was something that was trained. To not have that. Ugh. Or enjoyers were quite happy in Rome. The <laughs> urine would be collected from public toilets and cesspools. There's a Roman, by the way, that's what a, um, uh, we're quite happy in Rome. The public restrooms looked like back in ancient Rome. Like that, you would do that. And by the way, you know how you wiped? It was like a spongy kind of thing on a stick. That's how, that's how you wiped. But yeah, this is, uh, this is what a public restroom would have looked like. Um, I, don't, I don't know if this, I know the, the Colosseum, I believe, had two public restrooms in it. Um, I don't know if, exactly what it looked like because that hadn't survived, but it might could have looked like this. So you're watching your fights, you're watching your midget gladiator little people fights or whatever, and then you got to go take a dump or whatever, and then you go over. This this episode's disgusting. Now, do I even want to post this? If I If you're watching this, it's because I just, I posted it under... Uh, Probably under, not under good uh, uh, reasons. Urine would be collected from public <laughs> toilets and cesspools. When the finances of the Roman Empire had been crippled after nearly two years of civil war, Vespasian inherited the empire and left his successor with a profit through the urine tax collection. <laughs> nice. When Titus Vespasian's son blamed his father for applying the tax on urine, 
He held a piece of gold coin procured from the tax against his nose and replied, money does not stink. Number seven, <laughs> slave manager. Oh, no. Oh, well, yeah. Slavery is so, oh, man, such a profitable industry back then. Vicarious were the middle managers between their masters and their fellow slaves. And yeah, we're literally talking about real middle manager slaves who managed other slaves. That just sounds like slavery with extra steps. Ooh la la, someone's gonna get laid in college. These vicars <laughs> would mostly do office work to manage their master's possessions and businesses. It wasn't so bad of a gig either, since it Rick. turns out that some vicars would be given access to part or all of their master's assets. Mm. Some of them would be paid a portion of the profits made, allowing them to eventually buy their freedom. Ironically, yeah, um, unlike chattel slavery, yeah, slavery could or slaves could eventually buy their freedom in um, in Rome. Slavery slavery had a pretty wide like uh, form of uses in the Roman Empire, and actually in in in, in history, we get very fixated on like um, Atlantic chattel slavery. Um, there were a lot of different forms of it. I mean, some slaves held high positions. Look at the Janissaries in the Ottoman Empire, who were loyal. Uh, servants of of uh, the Ottoman Sultan and were high position, you know, high position. So, uh, yeah, slavery is very has a very diverse history. Buy their own and I mean, in no situation, I would say it's good, <laughs> or it was great for those people, but uh, it was usually terrible. But there were also varying levels slaves of slaves and vicar to continue growing their wealth. So just imagine working at Amazon and you have the same experience. But that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching. This was just casual, and I'm standing outside your window. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right, final thoughts. All right, well, I've covered a lot of gross videos and gross topics, I feel like, in my few years of doing this. And this is definitely going to rank up there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And should know that because everyone in history is really gross. I'm sure somebody will think we're gross uh, in, in, in when people are studying our time. But, like, truly pretty gross. All right. Anyways, hope you all enjoyed this if you're able to stomach through it. And with that, we'll see y'all next time. Bye.